Hello, I'm Dinesh D'Souza, and in this concluding segment, I'm going to talk about the last chapter of my new book, The Roots of Obama's Rage. The book covers some very controversial and even uh, shocking material. I just want to read a few lines. We are today living out the script for America and the world that was dreamed up not by Obama, but by Obama's father. Think about what this means. The most powerful country in the world is being governed according to the dreams of a Luo tribesman of the 1950s, a polygamist who abandoned his wives, drank himself into stupors, and bounced around on two iron legs after his real legs had to be amputated because of a car crash, raging against the world for denying him the realization of his anti-colonial ambitions. This philandering, inebriated African socialist is now setting the nation's agenda through the reincarnation of his dreams in his son. The son is the one who is making it happen, but the son is, as he candidly admits, only living out his father's dream. The invisible father provides the inspiration, and the son dutifully gets the job done. America today is being governed by a ghost. Now, you might ask, where am I getting all this stuff from? And the answer is, I'm getting it from Obama. Obama is one of the most self-conscious and candid writers about his own experience. Many journalists and scholars have tracked down the details of Obama's life. Obama is not always fully candid. He leaves stuff out. So I have to fill that picture in. I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a graduate of Dartmouth College. I studied also at Princeton. Uh, I was a policy analyst in the White House for two years. Uh, for 10 years, I was a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and then a scholar for about eight years uh, at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. I'm currently the president of the King's College in New York City. So I ha I've now written 10 books. This is my 10th uh, book. Uh, and in all of them, uh, I have brought a careful and detailed and precise scholarship. My book is elaborately footnoted. Most of the sources are available online. So all you have to do is click uh, and you can see for yourself. You can read Obama's father's paper for yourself. Uh, you can discover the quotations uh, made by Obama and others for yourself directly. It's an easily verifiable book. There's nothing in it that is based upon secret or unpublished data. Now, I want to leave you with a thought about colonialism because here's the great irony. I grew up in the first bloom of Indian independence. The British left India in 1947. I was born same year as Obama, 1961. Uh, and, and when I was growing up, anti-colonialism was the big issue. That's what my parents, my relatives talked about. But today, anti-colonialism is a dead issue because colonialism is dead. Nobody cares about it. Why? Because poor countries have found a better solution to the problem of backwardness. The economist Veblen once spoke about the privilege of backwardness. And what he meant is that if you are a backward country, you have a huge advantage your labor cost is low. So if you can figure out to make stuff, you can make it more cheaply and sell it abroad for less than people in those countries. That's what China is doing, that's what India is doing, and also Indonesia and Brazil. So now all these third world countries, we don't call them third world so much anymore, they are emerging markets, and they are growing at three, five, and 10 times the pace of the United States. So we are in a tough competitive fight in America against these fast growing emerging markets. Now what does Obama think about globalization, about free trade, about emerging markets? He doesn't like it. In fact, Indonesia, which is a Muslim country, but a country that's been embracing globalization, cutting taxes, encouraging entrepreneurship, and is, by the way, growing at 6% a year. When Obama was elected, a statue of Obama was erected in a large public park in Jakarta to honor Obama, who lived in Indonesia. A few months ago, the statue was taken down. Why? Due to popular signatures. Uh, thousands of Indonesians basically said, Obama doesn't care about Indonesia, he doesn't care about Asia, and he's done nothing for us. So the Indonesians said, okay, well, why have his statue up here? Down it went. And, and so while Obama has no interest in globalization, in markets, 
because all of that to him is neo-colonialism. That's a form of exploitation, profit, entrepreneurship. These are dirty words for Obama. So Obama goes to Ghana recently to speak to Africa. He's the son of Africa, the first American president of African roots. And he makes an interesting point. He says, when I was growing up, he says, South Korea was a lot poorer than Kenya. But now South Korea is an advanced country. The airport is fantastic. It's glitzier than many American cities. So you think Obama would say, here in Africa, we better follow what these Asians are doing. Cut taxes, encourage entrepreneurship. He says nothing like this. Instead, all he talks about is the U.S. government trying to give more foreign aid to Africa. The point I want to make is, here's Obama. He has all this power. He can do a lot for Africa. If he were to encourage enterprise zones, uh, encourage the Africans to make stuff that other people want to buy, he could be helping the continent. But because he is frozen in his father's anti-colonial ideology, he's frozen in the ideology of the 1950s, He's helpless. All he can do is talk about transferring wealth from us to them, and if the Congress won't approve, he has nothing else to offer Africa. So the point I'm trying to make is globally, colonialism is dead. There's only one anti-colonial left in the world, and this is the man in the White House. He is living in a time machine, his father's time machine. And now, in a way, that's to me more dangerous than if Obama were, if Obama were a Muslim, well, maybe he could be a moderate Muslim, not a radical Muslim, and that would be fine. If he were a socialist, maybe he got some wacky socialist ideas in college, he can outgrow them, he can see it doesn't work. But the problem is if Obama is like the Schwarzenegger guy in the movie who finds his family killed, then you are a man on a mission. You can see nothing else. If people come to you and say, hey, there's a gulf spill, you're like, don't bother me about that. I'm a man on a mission. So Obama is like the toy soldier who walks into the wall and hey, he keeps going. That's all he knows how to do. He can't change. He's too dug in. So in a sense, this is our predicament. We are in the bizarre situation where America now, we're on top of the world and America's been on top of the world since World War II. But it's very precarious up here. We see these other hungry, greedy countries are growing. They're challenging American supremacy. And so the question is, how long can we maintain our moment in the sun? Other empires, other great countries on top, once they lost that position, they never came back. The Greeks were once on top. They've never come back. The Romans, the British Empire, the sun has finally set on the British Empire. So once the American moment passes, I am very doubtful it will ever return. To me, the scary thing is we are living in a society where the man who is doing the most to bring an end to the American position in the world is the man entrusted with maintaining that position, the man sitting in the White House, Barack Obama. So I think it's time that change come to America once again, only this time we have to change the man in the White House.